Last part we mainly discussed the watchful peace and its aftermath. It started with Gandalf exploring, Dol Guldur and Sauron fleeing from there for 400 years. Even though this time was peaceful, the wise felt that something was wrong and expected the evil to reveal itself at any time, so they were watchful. After that time of peace, shortly before the One Ring was found, Sauron returned with increased strength to Dol Guldur and things started to change again in Middle-earth. I called it the prelude to The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. With the One Ring found, the White Council founded, Gondor almost being conquered by an Easterling tribe called the Balchoth, the foundation of Rohan and the dwarves in conflict with the dragons of the northern waste, a lot was happening in these difficult times. We stop with Thor, Thorin Oakenshield's grandfather coming to Erebor and about a century where very little happened after it. My name is Chris aka The Philosopher's Games and before we start a few hints as always. This video is still part of my Who is Elrond video and we're slowly coming to the end. This video is also perfectly understandable if you have not seen the other videos yet. It covers two topics, the dwarves in the north and the war of the Rohirrim in the second part. I also try to pronounce names as Tolkien described it, which means there will be trilled R's. Shoutouts to the artists who allowed me to use their fantastic artworks like Kimberly 80, Sara Morello, Ted Naismith, Jenny Dolphin and all the others. And spoiler warning. Not much happens in the next 100 years after Third Age 2590. In Erebor life was good for the dwarves after they had to flee again from the Grey Mountains. They prospered and so did the region. Third Age 2644 Throin II, Thorin Oakenshield's father, is born. I assume named in honor to Thror's ancestor Throin I, who originally founded Erebor Third Age 1999, so about 600 years prior. He also found the Arkenstone in the mountain, so it makes sense for Thror to name his son after him as he also founded Erebor again and brought the house of Durin back there, including Borin, the brother of his father. From that line is for example Balin, Dwalin, Gloin and Gimli. We can read in Appendix A, to the great hall of Throin, Thror brought back the Arkenstone and he had his folk prospered and became rich and they had the friendship of all men that dwelt near. We talked at the very beginning in part 1 covering the first age about this stone and speculated about Tolkien maybe having the idea of it being one of the three Silmarilli very early on, though that changed for sure. This quote also implies that Erebor was already, at least in parts, an established place with kingly halls when Thror arrived. It was just abandoned by the dwarves 3rd age 2210, about 380 years ago, under Throin I's son Thorin I. We see that the naming scheme of Thror's ass is exactly the same, which is for sure a bit confusing. I guess Thror wanted to honor his ancestors who established Erebor as Dwarven Realm, but I think he for sure envisioned that this time everything should be better than last time. Maybe this time he wanted to create a good timeline where the dwarves now stay in Erebor and find their new home, making it into the new big Dwarven Realm after the fall of Khazad-dûm, that is Moria. Maybe seeing the decision to abandon Erebor 380 years ago as a mistake but we know how the story will end. Maybe it was a bad omen to name the heirs Thorin and Thorin again because history will repeat itself in a way. As Thorin I, Thorin II Oakenshield would have to abandon Erebor again, though for different reasons. There are further differences though, for example Throin II and Thror survive the attack of Smaug and fled together, while Throin I died of old age in Erebor and Thorin I abandoned Erebor willingly due to his folk preferring the Grey Mountains. Maybe because they were more similar to the Misty Mountains than the Lonely Mountain, but if we look even further into the future, we also know that the dwarves will return to Erebor and it will indeed become the new home of the dwarves. If we jump back to Eriador, we also find an interesting side note, quote from Appendix B. Circa 
Third Age 2670, Tobold plants pipe wheat in the south farthing. In a way this is an obscure note in Appendix B if we see it the tale of years as historical records where we often find huge deeds and significant historical events like Easterlings overrunning Gondor, the destruction of Osgiliath, the One Ring being found and the White Council founded. It seems almost funny reading this note. We can though observe two things here. First, it was important enough for Tolkien, who also smoked the pipe, to mention it here and second, these historic records are truly from the Red Book of Westmarch, so they were collected and written down by hobbits and here we definitely see a little touch of that. The theme of the hobbits is that they were small and unimportant in the grand schemes of history but that changed one day when Bilbo found the One Ring and Frodo brought it to Mount Doom. In a way they led the free peoples of Middle Earth to victory over evil, becoming some of these big historic events and names noteworthy in historical records themselves. As such it only makes sense that these little touches of hobbit history important for the Shire folk are recorded besides the names of great kings and battles. We of course find these hobbit related records prior to the year 2670 in the tale of years of the third age but those seemed less unusual in a sense as they are tied to history like King Argileb the second granting them land which becomes the Shire. But Tobold Hornblower laying the foundation for old Toby is for sure only important to some people though the Shire exported its pipe wheat in some form I guess. In Isenyard Merry and Pippin find it in the books and we also have this scene in the films. Aragorn finds that strange quote. All except one thing said Aragorn, leave from the south farthing in Isenyard. The more I consider it the more curious I find it. I have never been in Isenyard but I have journeyed in this land and I know well the empty countries that lie between Rohan and the Shire. Neither goods nor folk have passed that way for many a long year, not openly. Saruman had secret dealings with someone in the Shire I guess. This might hint at the later events in the Shire, the scouring of the Shire. The next entry in Appendix B is also Hobbit related. However, also things happen outside the Shire. In Gondor, Exthelion I rebuilds the White Tower in Minas Tiris, 3rd age 2698. Another obscure note, we know it was first built about 800 years ago, 3rd age 1900 by King Kalimechtar. Here Minas Tiris was still called Minas Arnor. However I could find no note that explains the need to rebuild the White Tower of Exthelion. Was it destroyed? Was it just refurbished? Maybe expanded? We don't know. In the unfinished tales we can read. History would indeed make it clear that neither Orthanc nor the White Tower in Minas Tiris had ever been captured or sacked by enemies and it might therefore be supposed that the stones were most probably intact and remained in their ancient sites but it could not be certain that they had not been removed by the stewards and perhaps buried deep in some secret treasure chamber, even one in some last hidden refuge in the mountains comparable to Dunharrow. This is about the Palantiri and it excludes a destruction I guess. Maybe it was rebuilt with that secret chamber in mind where the Palantiri of Minas Tiris was hidden as we know from the Lord of the Rings. Now with the end of the 27th century of the third age and the beginning of the 28th we enter a time where the powers of evil increase again. We discussed how orcs infested the misty mountains before which led to the attack on Elrond's wife Kilibrian and her leaving Middle Earth. It seems the orcs became strong enough again to attack Eriador quote 3rd age 2740. Orcs renew their invasion of Eriador. This land had mostly peace after the defeat of the Witch King and Angmar 765 years ago. Now at least the orcs were back. The Dunedain rangers of the north under chieftain Arasuil accompanied by Elrond's sons Eladan and Elrohir fought them and they managed to hold them back except for one large band of orcs led by the goblin king Golfimbul from Mount Gram. 
Golfimbo managed to enter Eriador so far west that he reached the Shire's north farthing. But Bendobras took, after the known as Bullroarer took, gathered a hobbit force and met Golfimbul and his orcs in the Battle of the Greenfields, 3rd age 2747, so seven years after the invasion of Eriador began. Bullroarer was a big hobbit who could ride a horse. In this battle he charged at Golfimbul and knocked off the head of the Goblin King with a club, sending it flying. It landed in a rabbit hole. You clearly notice how we enter the hobbit territory here. The other orcs fled from battle and the Shire would not be attacked for quite some time after this. I assume the rangers of the Norse and Elrond's sons handled the rest. It's not mentioned if Elrond also sent some more forces from Rivendell or if Eladan and Elrohir were actually accompanied by other elves in their service, but I could imagine that this was the case, especially if we consider that the battles against these orcs lasted seven years in that region. According to a timetable in Peoples of Middle-earth, the battles regarding this orc invasion ended 3rd age 2748, so a year later. After that the orcs were probably defeated. Bandobras took became a hobbit hero and also due to how he slew Golfimbul, the game or sport golf was invented, which is also part of the Goblin King's name. It's a very funny story and really a bit anachronistic. One could argue that this story hints at the Shire maybe already being in its anachronistic state we later find in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. I have no good theory on the name Golfimbul. It's very noticeable that Fimbul is an Old Norse word. In the Poetic Edda we find the Fimbulwetter, the Fimbul winter, which means great winter. So Fimbul means great or mighty and there will also be the long winter later in 3rd age 2758. In Old Norse Gol could be a form of the verb Gala and could mean I chanted in the sense of chanting a spell. Interestingly, in very early draft versions of The Hobbit, the Goblin King was still called Fingolfin, because Tolkien borrowed some names from his mythology for The Hobbit. I could also imagine Tolkien played around a bit with the syllables and changed them slightly, resulting in forming the name Golfimbul. What speaks for Old Norse inspiring the name might be that Gram has also Old Norse roots. The name of Sigurd's sword was Grammar. It's further unclear where exactly Mount Gram is. Karen Wynne Fonstead placed it here on her map in the Atlas of Middle Earth. I would assume it's part of the Misty Mountains in some form as well, but we don't know for sure. It could also be another name for Mount Gundabad. In very early versions it was already called Gram Hill, so Tolkien maybe saw it as necessary to change it to Mount Gram for the first edition of The Hobbit, indicating it being a mountain and not a hill, which brings us further away from all the hills in East Eriador to the Misty Mountains in my opinion. 3rd age 2754 the famous story of Helm Hammerhand, King of Rohan begins. In this context I also want to hint at my old History of Rohan video, though I guess it might need some updates. However, that year a lord named Freka talked to Helm Hammerhand. It seems Freka's ancestors, nobles of Rohan, mixed with lords of the Dune Landings and they lived somewhere around the source of the Adorn. In this context it must be mentioned that the Numenorians in the second age once drove the ancestors of the Dune Landings, who were also related to the Edain and with that also to the Numenorians as well, out of Eriador. In this context it makes sense that they potentially disliked the Gondorians and I guess also the Rohirrim as close ally of Gondor. I assume Gondor and Rohan also disliked the Dune Landings. Helm did not trust Freka, but he still invited him to councils. If this old feud had to do with them not trusting each other is not clear though, but I assume Freka was kind of a potential bridge between the Dune Landings and the people of Rohan. 
The Rohirrim might have even considered mingling with those dune landings as weakening his bloodline, but as said, both peoples are related. The Rohirrim are from the ancestors of the Edain House of Marach or House of Hador. The dune landings are related to the ancestors of the Edain House of Hales, also called Haladin, which ended in Beleriand during the First Age. The Dune Landing ancestors separated from the other Edain of their house when they together migrated west and settled in Eriador before reaching Beleriand, while the others continued their journey. Interestingly, mingling between these two houses was back in the day not seen as something bad. In fact, the grandmother of Tuor by his father's side was from the house of Hales. Remember, Tuor is the father of Earendil, the father of Elrond and Elros, so quite prominent. And Hales, a famous female leader of the house, was considered very brave and an Amazon. She even impressed the elves. Having women fight was not unusual for that house, but of course it was in that regard different to the other houses. Same with their language, which was different as well and was the reason why the Numenorians did not recognize these people as kin. They then fought them and drove them to Duneland, where they became known as the Dunelandings. See my strange who is Harless video for more information on her and her house. During one of these meetings, Freka asked the king that his son Wolf and Helm's daughter should marry, which ended in an argument. The king made fun of Freka, who gained some weight it seems. Of course, Freka had some words for Helm in return and at the end, when they talked alone, Helm punched him so hard in the face that Freka died from that mighty blow. There was a reason why Helm was called Hammerhand. This resulted in the king declaring Freka's descendants and men as enemies of Rohan and Freka's son Wolf allying with the Dune Landings, taking Isenyard and attacking Rohan four years later, third age 2758, with a great force. Gondor had a very big war against the Corsairs of Umbar at this time and could not send help. Though Helm killing Freka might have been glorified when this story is told, considering the law, it might have been a big mistake based on prejudice. Freka might have been a bridge between those two descendants of the Edain. Maybe this could have healed their feud. And this might also be the reason why very tough times are had for Helm while placing a further cornerstone for future conflicts. Due to the invasion of the Dune Landings, King Helm and his people fled to the Suthburg, the Southburg once built by Gondor, they called it Aglarond, which will be later called Hornburg or Hornburg and the fortress will be besieged by the invaders. One of Helm's sons, Hales, was slain defending Edoras, which was taken by Wulf, who sat on the throne in the Golden Hall. Some people of Rohan fled to Dunharrow instead though. On top of that, the mentioned long winter was at the end of this year as well, which made all people suffer. In it, the snow and harsh cold lasted for five months. Against the will of the king, his last son Hama went on a mission with some of his men to get secretly past the enemy due to the hunger and cold they suffered. Maybe to find some food, but they got into a snowstorm and were never seen again. In another version of the text, it seems both sons were lost in the snow. Helm, in grief and hunger, went out at nights clad in white, blowing his horn and sneaked into the enemy camp, killing his enemies with his bare hands, bringing fear into the hearts of the dune landings. This is how the Susburg, the Salzburg, got the name Hornburg or Hornburg. One night Helm did not return and he died to the cold and hunger, but he was still standing, not bending his knees. Wolf's father Freka said to him in the argument that old kings that refuse a prophet staff may fall on their knees. Helm did not fall on his knees and the enemies did not dare to come close. Legends say that Helm's horn can still be heard at nights and that he as Wraith would walk among the foes of Rohan and kill men with fear. A pretty epic story and legend, though wisdom was for sure not the foundation of this conflict. In the films we see a statue of Helm Hammerhand in the Hornburg and the upcoming anime film The War of the Rohirrim will cover it as well. I hope it will be good. 
However, Freyalaf, the son of Helm's sister Hild, hit with some men in Dunharrow, which we also know from the films. Many people of Rohan fled there as well and after the winter waned, he started a surprise attack on Edoras and indeed surprised Wolf and the Dune landings there. In the fight he slew Wolf and could use the momentum to also fight the other Dune landings. When at some point also Gondor repelled all the attacks of the Corsairs, they were able to send help as well. We can read by roads both east and west of the mountains. As a result, the dune landings were defeated and driven out of Rohan and even Isenyard. Freyalaf Hilde's son became the next king, but it took Rohan a long time to recover from this invasion and the long winter. Of course this is far away from Elrond, but it's an interesting time and there are some small connections to Eriador and also indirectly to Elrond. So meanwhile west of the Misty Mountains, the long winter also troubled the people there. Cold and hunger plagued the people in that region as well, including the hobbits. In Appendix B we find the note, Gandalf comes to the aid of the Shire folk, which is one of the first mentions of Gandalf in context of the Shire I know of. If Gandalf knew Bulrower took himself already is not 100% clear, but it's for sure possible. However, as said, in the long winter Gandalf has met and helped the hobbits. In the Unfinished Tales we find further information on this. He explains how the hobbits showed pity and helped one another in these dire times which impressed him and was the reason why they survived according to him. I like how compassion and pity for others is always associated with wisdom in Tolkien's works. In this context I could also imagine that Elrond and the elves helped the people in Eriador as well in some form or at least knew about Gandalf doing so, but that is just my speculation. As said some time ago Mithrandir was closest in council with Elrond and the elves. However, the most interesting connection between the events in Rohan, Gandalf and Elrond was another white council member, Saruman. When Rohan celebrated their victory against the Dune landings, the white wizard appeared, bringing gifts and praising the deeds and valor of the Rohirrim, which for sure made him a welcome guest, which we can also read. With getting the friendship of the weakened Rohirrim he for sure offered himself to be a strong ally and as we know his voice is very convincing. It would be wise and at that time it was. Saruman had Isenyard in mind but Rohan could not give it to him because Isenyard was still considered part of Gondor. However, the ruling steward Beren also needed to catch a break from all the attacks of the Corsairs and also saw it beneficial to have a strong ally like Saruman who went most among men and he was subtle in speech and skilled in all the devices of smithcraft positioned there. As a result the steward made the white wizard a lieutenant of the steward of Gondor and warden of the tower and gave him the keys of Orthanc. We can read that for a time Saruman behaved as a lord of men, but he for sure also had more in mind. We can read that the tower or thunk could not be harmed or entered by anyone without those keys. So even though the dune landings took Isenyard for some time, it seems they never entered the tower. So all its treasures were potentially still inside and as we all know, its biggest one was still there for sure, the Palantir of Orthanc. In a way it's strange that Gondor abandoned Isenyard and Orthanc at some point, especially if you consider that a powerful artifact was in it still. This might show that also Gondor was in decline and completely neglected the northern realm after gifting it to Rohan. It might also be possible that after the last king Earnur died in Minas Morgul, the knowledge of what is in that tower might have been lost so that the steward did not know. I can only speculate. But of course having Saruman in Isenyard for sure stabilized things at the gap of Rohan. Both the king of Rohan and the ruling steward of Gondor were very happy that Saruman was there. Still it seems as if Saruman was very secretive about this place. We don't know if any white council meetings were held there. The next one will be in Rivendell though. But that Saruman 
took or thunk was for sure something that did not go unnoticed by the otherwise and I can see that they also saw it as beneficial. Keep in mind that Sauron is also living next door in Dol Guldur and that the orcs infested the Misty Mountains. Saruman having a stronghold there must have been considered a very strong move at this time. We can also read that Saruman later cared less about being a lieutenant of Gondor, isolating himself more and more, fortifying the stronghold and taking it for himself to rule. At some point in his mind he wanted to make it a place of power and fear, rivaling Barad-dûr, the dark tower of Sauron. Of course also new trouble was at the horizon already in the east in form of a dragon but that is a topic for the next part which will bring us closer to the events of the Hobbit. Thank you for watching. As you noticed we are back to covering book lore on this channel and I hope it gets some views. I know more people wanted to see the next Who is Galadriel video but I felt more like doing this one first. Considering how far we got here in the story we still have quite a lot to cover to reach Lord of the Rings. So I guess at least two more videos of this length if not three. Next will be the prelude to The Hobbit and maybe the events of The Hobbit itself. Looking forward to this as well. Maybe let me know what you want to see next. The next part of this video series or who is Galadriel part 2. I also want to make a dedicated video about the blue wizards at some point and I have other ideas for lore videos as well. Next week there will also be another lore Q&A livestream on YouTube and we have to find a date for the two towers watch party. I also know this video is a bit late but I was sick and my voice was not fully there. Also after the last two marathon months I wanted to slow down a bit to healthy work hours again. Also if you are interested in my opinion on the new The Fall of Numenor book I made a review as well. If you liked this video here feel free to press the like and subscribe button, leave a comment and maybe recommend me to other Tolkien fans. Also check out my other lore content. This was part 9 of Who is Elrond so if you have not seen the other parts yet there are 7 plus hours more of this. Playlists are in the description. Shoutouts to the artists and all you people who support me. Again thank you for watching and goodbye.